very much, Dr. Bhutta, for agreeing to do this for us, uh, again, at very short notice. Uh, most of you know who Dr. Bhutta is. You've been touched by uh, him and his work, I'm sure. Uh, and if I were to do a proper introduction for Dr. Bhutta, I would be talking for an hour and would not finish. So I'm just going to very quickly just say that Dr. Bhutta's most recent uh, honor is that he is the founding director of the Institute of Global Health and Development at the AKU, at this new, newly uh, uh, coined institute. And he has just been elected the fellow of the Royal Society. So great, great honors and many, many great honors preceding that, which I cannot uh, all list. Uh, all I can say is that when we proudly say that we stand on the shoulders of giants at AKU, uh, Dr. Bhutta's broad and tall shoulders uh, stand far and above everyone else's. So thank you very much, Dr. Bhutta, for all your work in pediatrics and child health and in women's health and in public health in general for Pakistan. You've set a platform where a number of us can now climb on board. A number of us have been doing it and uh, we're glad that you are continuing to work with us in that regard. So thank you very much. And I'll Thank let you. you begin. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to make a relatively short presentation. Um, um, one of our AKU alumni, Umar Irfan, who I hope is joining, has been working with me on a systematic review of COVID-19 for children across the world. He summarized over 60 studies. I'm not going to go through all of those, except I think you are all interested in knowing one basic thing. Does this thing affect children? If it does, how much severity? Is it something that all pediatricians should be worried about, particularly in Pakistan, uh, where the disease is still a little bit of an enigma because we haven't had the thousands and thousands of, of deaths and, uh, and doomsday scenario that was predicted. But I'd like to spend a fair bit of time on <clears throat> perhaps answering specific questions from your daily practice as to what we should be doing together as pediatricians. And this is not something that concerns only pediatricians in Pakistan. As you know, we've been doing this worldwide with pediatricians from the IPA platform. So I'll try and cover some aspects of what we know about the disorder, the age distribution. Uh, I'll spend a little bit of time on the indirect effects because that affects pediatricians by and large. And then what do we know about perinatal transmission and breastfeeding? And I'll tell you some very recent data that just came out two days ago uh, that are promising. And, and then some guidance for pediatricians. So what was known about COVID in children largely stemmed from the initial experience of the outbreak in China, and then partly in Europe and, and North America. And in the early three months of this uh, epidemic, pandemic, uh, children seemed to be largely untouched. So as you see over here, both in terms of cases and case fatality, very, very small minority, generally about one to one and a half percent of those affected were in children. And in China, uh, the attack rates around 7%. Uh, and in general, serious illness uh, requiring hospitalization was very rare. Only one child died out of a study of around 2,000 children from the initial data in China. So it wasn't th thought to be very severe. And in fact, in the recent uh, evaluation of over 14,000 deaths in New York, uh, uh, there were only about seven pediatric deaths, and out of those, those six had a comorbidity. So it, comorbidities or coexisting illnesses has been a very important part of this disease in both adults as well as in children. In the Italian outbreak, you begin to see that, again, around one and a half, 1.2 percent pediatric, zero to 18 years of age, and virtually no deaths in, in this particular age spectrum. So Again, European experience so far uh, from, from parts of Europe where it was. And in the US, uh, until this very recent last two weeks where we have begun to see some, some issues that I will talk about briefly, um, the proportions of children affected, uh, as well as those who had serious illness, was about the same that was part of the global experience. And this was one of the reasons why, in their summary, the World Health Organization had largely said, pediatric cases may not be necessarily a, a problem for the health system, but they may be important in transmission. And therefore you need to principally deal with pediatric uh, cases by mitigation strategies, such as closure of schools and daycare centers for children. Um, most of the children who have been acquiring infections have acquired it from family members. 
So about 90% community acquired. I'll talk about vertical transmission from the mother in a, in a minute. But the signal that there may be some issues came from the fact that about 60%, 50-60% ended up by being hospitalized. Maybe it's because as parents, we have a lower threshold for hospitalizing children. So when children have a known COVID positive, they a fair number do end up in hospital and others are managed with very mild illnesses in, at home. But about 60% in the US were hospitalized. And, and, and about a third are in the adolescent age group. So you must be also very cognizant that adolescents may have COVID and they are generally like young adults in terms of their outcome. They generally seem to have a milder illness compared to adults. And you can see this also from the data looking at symptomatology, headaches, sore throat, myalgia, shortness of breath, et cetera. Uh, but these are data that were from the CDC uh, characterization of pediatric disease about two and a half, three weeks ago. Very recently, we have begun to see reports of what is called multi-system inflammatory disease. Um, a Kawasaki-like syndrome or a toxic shock-like syndrome, when the first few cases came out, they, they were reminiscent of what you get with staph toxic shock. Um, in late April, you had one of the first cases come, uh, come on. This was a six-month-old infant seen in Stanford. Uh, it wasn't quite clear whether this was an anomaly. And then a large cluster of cases came out in the UK that have been summarized and very recently you may have heard of the, of the clustering of cases in New York that led the mayor of New York to hold a press conference yesterday <coughs> and talk about this particular syndrome. Now, it's too early to call this Kawasaki because I think we need to know a little bit more and the differences of pathology. As many of you know, initially what was thought to be just an inflammation and bacterial pneumonia superinfection is now recognized widely to be a coagulopathy. So we are still learning a lot more about COVID infection and what it does. So I'm not as yet 100% sure that what we have here is the same as what you used to see with Kawasaki syndrome uh, classically described. But the bottom line is many of these children have features of uh, general arthritis, including coronary arteries. They have fever, rash, conjunctivitis, and they may have cytokine storm that may be evident you must be very, very aware of the potential coagulopathies in these children uh, and GI symptoms in particular. Within the last 48 hours, there has been a publication which has definitively shown that the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the coronavirus, can actually infect gut uh, cells and that these patients shed the virus in their stool. So it is not just airborne transmission. This is a very important point for pediatricians to note. It's also transmission through the fecal-oral route of this particular virus that we may be concerned about. I have to tell you this, it's not yet public knowledge, that Pakistan government has been doing COVID virus surveillance in the polio surveillance sites in the sewage in various districts of Pakistan. And data that I was shown just two days ago shows that in all the surveillance sites that they've looked at COVID virus, they have found the virus. So it is circulating in our community and, and is also um, uh, transmitted through this mechanism. So hand washing and hygiene becomes even more important and just wearing a mask is not necessarily enough. So all of you know about the features of the palmar erythema, the rash, the peeling, conjunctivitis, really a strawberry tongue. Uh, and what was known as COVID toes. So many in, in Canada here, for example, Everybody's been watching out for what happens to the toes and hands of many of these children with COVID infection. We believe that this is related to microthrombi, but it's something that every pediatrician must be concerned about. Um, at the moment, the guidelines are that this must be taken very seriously, that these children should be hospitalized if they have anything suggestive of this, uh, and they need to have a panel of investigations that need to exclude uh, the possibility of DIC and other cytokine-related uh, storm. They need to have a cardiac evaluation. So just like with Kawasaki, you need to do a 2D echo. At this point in time, the treatment modalities are not necessarily clear. So we don't know whether we need to give IVIG or whether or not just standard therapy for COVID as is being recommended needs to happen. 
As I mentioned yesterday, we were told about this cluster of 38 cases with pediatric multisystem inflammatory disease in New York, with around 80 cases in, in the United States. So early days, and uh, uh, please watch out for publications in this regard. Um, and there are some standard case definitions, um, which I thought we would share with you. Uh, Irfan has put this together. Um, so persistent fever, right? Neutrophilia, elevated CRP, lymphopenia, multi-organ dysfunctions, and where you your bacterial cultures may not necessarily show any other microbial cause. Now, I know that this may be a problem in Pakistan because we are generally not able to exclude many of these with certainty. Um, but if you see a child with coronavirus posit positive testing and these features, or just these features alone, please be very cognizant that you may be dealing with with this particular illness and these children should be hospitalized and cared for. Uh, they, there has been at least one reported death um, of a child with uh, uh, this hyperinflammatory syndrome from, from the UK. And I was very intrigued by this case series that came out of the UK that a large proportion, in fact, all of these cases are non-Caucasian. They are Afro-Caribbean or Asian. And there has been a publication just a couple of days ago showing that at least in the UK experience, uh, the Asian minorities and other Afro-Caribbean minorities have had much more severe disease. So don't let people tell you that Pakistanis have Allah ki rahmat and that they may not necessarily have this disease uh, or severe disease. This can kill anybody as many of us have seen. And even in children, uh, the clinical course may be quite severe. So to summarize from the clinical course, uh, about one and a half percent, two percent of all cases are in children, and and generally, while pediatric manifestations are typical and uh, are, are are atypical and milder, uh, but they can be very severe. And I've just showed you data to indicate that this systemic inflammatory syndrome can be quite remarkable. There are uh, other issues around vertical transmission, and I do not go through that in great detail, except to say that theoretically, yes, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, coronavirus can be transmitted from the mother to the baby. Uh, I know that we have had a couple of births in Pakistan where the mother's been positive, baby's not been positive. Uh, in general, what people ask is, uh, should they be delivered by cesarean section? Uh, should the mother's breastfeed or not? The bottom line is we are rec recommending that mothers and babies should be cohorted together and that you don't need to deliver them by cesarean section and that they continue to breastfeed with precautions in terms of contact. And now with the reporting from uh, Stanford, and, uh, not, not Stanford, Davis and, uh, and New York, that the maternal breast milk contains antibodies to SARS-CoV virus IgA, I think, very soon you will begin to find that breastfeeding recommendations will become even stronger. So at this point in time, the standard of care from WHO and from uh, just basically looking at the cost benefit ratio is that we continue to breastfeed. Uh, there is this question, should people be taking precautions? And I think yes, just the fact that so many uh, obstetricians have been infected in Pakistan, largely just from their clinical practice, uh, I think general precautions uh, with PPE when dealing with COVID positive mothers and, and pregnancies should be in place. Not maybe to this extreme and in terms of intubation and all, but just make sure that you have facial protection, that you wear gloves, and, and that you also have uh, face masks on. And as I said, over time now, hand washing, gloves, and those protections will become extremely important in prevention strategies. Um, I'm not going to go through di diagnosis, except to say that government of Pakistan is doing its level best in terms of uh, community education uh, for people with coronavirus and COVID infection. Some of the things that are being done, I don't necessarily agree with, and I've raised it at the highest level, uh, such as, for example, very draconian measures of isolating or quarantining people with agencies jumping in. I think there should be a lot more community awareness of the importance of self-quarantine and isolation in terms of protecting other and protecting others in the family. 
and importantly, this mother baby kind of relationship in the first few days, which is easier in our culture because moms and babies typically are together in the first 40 days. I think this is extremely important as the transmission in pregnancy becomes much more rampant. I'll quickly just finish with these indirect effects that we are very concerned about worldwide on children. And children have been therefore one of the largest victims of uh, this coronavirus outbreak. They are victims of this outbreak because it affects the poorest of the poor. And the mitigation strategies that have led to the growth of poverty worldwide, also in Pakistan, by many daily wage laborers losing their daily income, affects disproportionately children by in terms of food insecurity, in terms of risks of, uh, of poor care. As you know, maternal child health services and outpatients in many public hospitals have been closed. And, as a, and because pay, people and parents have not been able to move, care seeking for many disorders has not been optimal. And we are very concerned that this would lead to a spike in child mortality overall. Uh, but what we know is that from school closures, around one and a half billion children are out of school. And they will be out of school for months. And we know from the Ebola experience that some of the consequences of school closure for the youngest children, those who cannot be educated by any other means, um, uh, would have a long lasting effect. So we are very keen that as the government reopens things, that we try and get children back to school. And I'm told that by the middle of July, that will happen. I'm not very happy about it, but that's the way it's been. In around 188 countries, these are generalized school closures, unprecedented in the history of mankind, and just removed an entire generation from the schooling system just like that. So that will have consequences. Uh, we estimate that around 60 million children will fall into extreme poverty. And this learning crisis will also be accompanied by these threats to child survival and health because immunizations have gone down to virtually zero in many places. We have just been looking at this data in the 12 districts that I work in, in rural Pakistan, Sindh and Rajasthan, uh, and we find that immunizations have gone down by 60, 70 percent. Tetanus topsoil in mothers gone down by 80 percent in one instance. And this needs to be cranked up very quickly because this will have consequences in terms of disease outbreak. We expect that malnutrition rates will rise. And we are also very concerned as the Pakistan Pediatric Association should be on the impact of just sequestering families uh, on child violence, child abuse, when people are locked up for weeks and months in a very confined thing. I mean, this is something that you should be aware of in any circumstance. So I'm going to stop at this. There are lots of things that can be done, but I would rather answer questions on this than to give you a one size fit all. There is contextual, uh, there are contextual solutions, but in Pakistan, pediatricians are at the forefront of what should be done to protect mothers and children at this time of great crisis. So Salman and Sajid, if, uh, if it's okay, I'll be very happy to take questions for the remaining of the time. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhutra. That was a very, very good introduction to this. I think uh, we really are interested uh, in the public health perspective and helping you know, figure out how do we move forward in Pakistan? How do we get the ailing health system and the public health system back? Uh, and how do we counter this threat? So Dr. Sajid, over to you. You can. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Salman. So, the, uh, sir, the, word, uh, the first question is from Dr. Shabina Arab. She is asking the uh, implication on public health, especially in contrast to Pakistan, where you know the, our public health infrastructure, our infrastructure is already weak. And her second question is uh, I'm just taking her question collectively. We are, she is writing, we are facing a lot of issue with the separation of mom and baby and its impact on breastfeeding rates. So on the second question, I think absolutely let me stick my neck out and say we should not be separating mothers and babies. Uh, you can use precautions such as, for example, face masks and gloves and hand washing, but the baby should stay with the mother. The evidence that we are now beginning to see of the protective effect of mother's own breast milk, I think we should be feeding the baby directly on the breast. And, and, and we know, we know generally that neonatal COVID infection from, um, from the environment or from the mother is generally extremely mild. So there is absolutely no reason to 
prevent that natural immunization of the baby from the mother. So uh, that should be absolutely the case. Secondly, I think in terms of public health impacts, whatever had to happen has happened already. We've been in a lockdown situation since the third week of March, and it's now almost the middle of uh, May. So I, I think what we need to do now is to use whatever means are available to us to reopen our MNCH services and child immunizations. It cannot be business as usual. So we know that we will not be able to see as much crowding. Uh, pediatricians need to adjust their practice, both in hospitals as well as in private practice to ensure that you now don't see the hundreds and hundreds of people that you saw before, but that we are able to provide some safe environment, social distancing. I think we need to see a situation where home visits by pediatricians and family physicians should again come back into favor. You know, about 50 to 100 years ago, that's how GPs used to work, is to visit families at home. And now, because many of the elderly are at risk of exposure, and many of these women and children are averse to come to hospitals, I think people should look at ways and means of doing it. In rural areas, lady health workers are the natural way of doing so. And, uh, and I think we should activate that program and pediatricians work with them in outreach. But in big cities, uh, I'm making a very strong suggestion to public health practitioners and workers that we should look at innovative ways of how we can provide services and, and reach out to families and children in need. So lots of questions on the chat. Uh, Sadi, do you want to look at them also? Do you want me to look at them? How? Oh. No, I can read read for you, Ji. Take selected that's questions which are important, right? Yeah, that that's what I'm I'm trying to basically do it. So Dr. Shaina Hanif is asking: Is uh, you know there's uh, we have the summer season ahead and uh, there's a lot of diarrheal cases. So how how we can differentiate among diarrheal cases and COVID-19? You cannot clinically, but remember that COVID-19 does not present with diarrhea alone. Diarrhea is a feature. So if you have a febrile child, they will have a fever in general. If you have a febrile child, if you have a history of contact, uh, most pediatric cases everywhere are not in isolation. There is almost always, as I said, 90, 91% cases have a contact, a history at home. So if your child develops the symptoms and there is somebody in the family or has had a contact with somebody with COVID, uh, you need to have a low threshold of suspicion. Um, but uh, isolated diarrhea is not something that we see. We see diarrhea as part of the syndrome of fever, inanition, being unwell, crying, and, and just generally unwell. Some proportion will present with some respiratory features as well. Dr. Ali Faisal is asking in long run, what is the best method for surveillance? Is the nasal swab or, or stool? Uh, I think stools we are not yet using at an individual level because they require, um, uh, you know, again, PCR and what have you, and it's a very messy PCR to do. So that's being used for surveillance. So that's not for ordinary pediatricians. You cannot culture the virus. So, so the best way of testing right now is by the PCR uh, on, a, on a nasopharyngeal swab or a non... So remember, you cannot use ordinary cottons, cotton buds, because cotton buds lead to negative results. They have something which affects the PCR test. Um, um, but nasopharyngeal swabs that are available from the government, I mean, they are the best way of diagnosing it. Okay, Aram Abu is asking if, if mother is not well and she cannot breastfeed her child, so what will be the next? Well, if the mother is not well and not well enough to breastfeed, which can happen, then of course, uh, wet nursing in our environment is the second best option. And uh, and if that is also not possible, generally in our Mahashara Mahol, that is possible. But if that is also not possible, then if you do have to give an alternative, then be extremely careful and do, do it with extreme hygiene and other precautions, only for the period of time that the mother is unable to breastfeed. Dr. Saad uh, Shafat is asking, there are several cases of one spouse becoming COVID positive while the other has remained negative despite, despite uh, very close personal contact and asymptomatic phase. So what is the justification or explanation of? Well, uh, 
I think one of the things that we are aware of is that the test can be falsely negative in many cases if the swab is not done properly. So that's one of the reasons why for nasal swabs, the general recommendation is being done by a health professional. Uh, sometimes repeat tests have to be done because, uh, uh, you know, it generally is uncommon in a, in a family if there are two, three people who are positive and one person is negative, uh, to imagine that innate immunity might be protecting that person. It can happen, but it's extremely rare. So our general recommendation would be that within a family, if you have a COVID case, unless you are dealing with uh, somebody who has got a known risk factor or a contact outside, somebody was traveling, has been in hospital, that you quarantine the family together. So, Kamran Fazak is asking the predominant symptoms is the, either the GI or respiratory. Well, okay. uh, G, GI is seen in about 10-15% of cases. Overall, uh, you know, what we need to know is that um, the disorder is still uh, evolving and in terms of firm presentation with one feature or the other, there will be some geographic or contextual differences. And now that you're getting into the summer, uh, there is a background of diarrhea in Pakistan anyway. So it, uh, you should not be regarding every diarrhea case that comes as COVID but you will have diarrhea or GI features in a proportion of children who are COVID positive. I was just telling before this call, the National Task Force, the Modeling Task Force in Islamabad, that you know they are, we are reporting COVID deaths and we are reporting cases as if nothing else ever, ever exists in Pakistan. Whereas the reality is that we have a child mortality rate close to 80 per thousand live births, as many of you know. And as Sajid Sufi and his team have done, they've done a national cause of death study for children under between zero to 19. There are lots and lots of disorders that affect children. So I'm just asking pediatricians, many learned pediatricians are on this call, that they should be cognizant of the fact that we have a background rate of child morbidity and mortality, and that those disorders will coexist with COVID. But when you see the combination of this in the presence of a contact or a positive case in the family, you should be well aware of the fact that this can affect children. You have already, though you have already commented on that, but still it's, a, I think, an important issue. What is your recommendation for a routine, routine immunization in current scenario? 100%. Those who have missed uh, their doses by a couple of months, it probably wouldn't matter too much, but they should get up to date very quickly. So the strong recommendation from everybody concerned is there is no reason to delay immunization. And I think we should be getting these kids back into the routine immunization as soon as possible. That's most important. Uh, and I know that's not going to happen very quickly, but it should happen. In fact, there is enough data to suggest that we should be looking at potentially the first doses the BCG and oral polio vaccines at birth, the birth dose is one of the most important vaccines. So I'm very concerned, and my team is also, that as we get back into, into the routine, and we are trying to do this in a couple of uh, districts in Pakistan, in KP and Balochistan, that we get this birth dose up and that we get the rest of the schedule uh, back up to stream as soon as possible. So yes, do, there is no reason to delay vaccinations. So next, Dr. Irfan is asking, what is the role of zinc, iron, folic acid, B12, vitamin A, and D, fortified products to boost up the immunity against so lot, COVID? A lot of uh, interest in this in France when people initially in the outbreak did not know what to do. They even gave high-dose zinc as part of this combination with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. As you know, within a month or two, all of that has been disproven. So my recommendation is do not think that any specific nutrition intervention, whether it's zinc, whether it's vitamin D, C, A, has any special role in COVID infections. But we know from the National Nutrition Survey that we did last year that a significant proportion of our children, uh, particularly in poor populations, are deficient in micronutrients, are, are malnourished. So your treatment of malnutrition and malnourished children should be the same as you would do in normal circumstances. So if you see a child who is multiple micronutrient deficient, who has evidence of rickets, 
or uh, uh, or you think is otherwise uh, in need of micronutrient supplements, by all means give it. But this is not a panacea and high dose micronutrients or any supplements for the treatment or mitigation of COVID are not being recommended right now. One thing I will say, be very careful as for general pediatrician, be very careful about giving iron when children are infected or have inflammation. In fact, very strongly, we would recommend that you don't. You don't give iron uh, unnecessarily, particularly in children who may be at risk of adverse effects. And, uh, and if you do want to give um, dietary advice, um, dietary diversification, and you want to give some routine multivitamins in it, they should not be high dose. So Dr. Abdul Rashid is asking about the immunity. What is your opinion? How to find out already immunized people? Should we go for screening of IgM in the population? I think we need to do those studies and we need to do those very rapidly, but they have to be done with the right kits uh, so that you don't have false positives, negatives. Antibody testing is only just coming in. Uh, we are planning a few studies in Pakistan with the right design, right population. We need to get a sense as to what is the prevalence of asymptomatic infection and therefore uh, perhaps some degree of background immunity in our population. Um, already this is being done in many parts of uh, Europe and North America. Um, so Pakistan will also follow suit. I don't think serological tests have a huge uh, role in diagnosis, still remains the, the domain of the PCR. But yes, I agree, we need to get a sense of what's happening in our population. You know, people are trying plasma therapy um, because they want to give antibodies to many of these patients who are ill. That means you are able to generate antibodies. Uh, we need to be able to use that for IgG and IgM assessment, but it needs to be done systematically and needs to be done with the right kit and, and, and the right methodology. So watch that space. We'll know a lot more, inshallah, in about two months from now. Okay, other next question was that from Nadeem Zafar. So you have already basically answered. Is the availability of IgM and IgG in Pakistan? Well, it's a it's a research domain right now. They're not available in uh, uh, in in the public space, but they will come in as soon as FDA validates some of these tests. I see that there's a question from Naim Zafar on vaccine availability. Uh, my understanding from Dr. Palitha at WHO and others is that uh, there is ample vaccine stock. So I suggest that uh, if you have run into this issue in any of the areas that you get hold of the EPI managers, I am assured that there's ample vaccine stock in Pakistan for your birth cohort. So there should be no shortage. There may be a distribution issue, uh, but there should be no shortage of vaccines outside the private sector. You may have some shortages because people are private sector is not able to get supplies, but in EPI programs, the warehouses have ample vaccine. So the next question is from Farukh Malak. What we know about the virus so far, when will it ever be safe to get back to school anyways? This is regarding the children. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think anyone does. This virus has been outsmarting everybody. Uh, just an hour ago, we were discussing what the shape of the curve of this pandemic will be for Pakistan. Our model that we've just put out in the public space and published on Medrash indicates that we will have this right up to the fall, that this will go on till July, August in some shape and form. We will be able to manage the number of cases we're presenting to hospitals but we will have deaths in rural areas and in communities where people just don't present. Uh, so we will be dealing with it this year. And as I said, the virus will not just suddenly disappear. Then you have this risk of the second wave that will come towards the fall and winter. And therefore the recommendation very strongly is that you just need to adapt. Remember, you cannot fight this virus to eliminate it. We are not eliminating this virus. We'll just have to coexist with this virus. So just like we live with rotavirus, just like we live with measles, we just have to adopt mitigation strategies until the time that a vaccine comes along. And I hope, inshallah, that a vaccine will be available uh, by next year. 
uh, that will be available through mechanisms for everybody in the world and not just the rich people. And that may make it a little better for us to address this. So Dr. Khalil is asking, uh, this is a really uh, important issue nowadays. The test done in the, in the government facility is positive and done very next day from another lab is private lab is, is negative. Which one to rely, especially if there is no symptom? Yeah. And this has happened very frequently nowadays. Yeah, I wish I knew the answer to this. I think you have to uh, look at uh, the quality of the test, how it was done. Um, and in general, to be safe, if you have features or if you have had a contact. Now, obviously, in Pakistan still, nobody totally asymptomatic is just walking in getting a test done. You either have to have a contact or you have to have some features and then and you are. And it's not just in Pakistan. In many places, still the case. So if you have a positive test, even weekly positive, uh, consider that a positive and, and take all precautions and, and restrictions in terms of movement and quarantine. Um, but I, don't, I wouldn't want to comment on the quality of tests in the private and public sector. I've heard stories the other way around also. So Dr. Bashir Abra is asking, this is also a very important question. How will we overcome on the history hiding by the parents, family, may result in infection transmission to the healthcare provider? This is an extremely People are hiding the symptoms and even also the travel history. Again, this, this is something that I've raised at the highest level. Even the Prime Minister is very well aware of the stigma issue. Uh, and I think we as pediatricians should do our best to reduce the demonization of this disease. And some of these are social things. I mean, this poor doctor who just died in Karachi a few last week um, because he did not want his illness to be known. Uh, I think that's the kind of reaction that we are seeing from many families because they fear the stigma, they fear the ostracization, they fear the fact that they will be finger pointing or what have you. So I think we as pediatricians owe it to everybody to make sure that we educate families that this is like any other infection, it's just highly infectious and it will go away. And, and that, you know, it will, if you recover from it, you are recovered. And by, by and large, reinfection has not been proven anywhere in the world. Those people who in Korea were thought to be reinfected were not reinfected. So I think uh, we will overcome this, but we can only overcome this if people are in the public health domain, <laughs> informing the government and informing their neighbors of the risk and practicing self-isolation and quarantine as best as possible. Dr. Naim Zafar is asking regarding the availability of a vaccine due to the air transport restrictions. Combo is not available even now. So what are our, our expectations when the vaccine I is? Thought, I thought I just answered. I thought I just answered that question. There is enough EPI vaccine. So use EPI vaccines. As I said, uh, you know, our issue is largely some of these vaccines for private use. Uh, which come through the companies, they may not be coming in, but the government has ample EPI vaccine stocks and uh, and children should be vaccinated. They may not be vaccinated in your clinics, but they should be vaccinated in the EPI centers. So there's one more question with this easing down the uh, lockdown or with this smart lock, lockdown or practically there is no lockdown. What is your personal opinion? Can our health infrastructure or healthcare provider can deal with, uh, with the peak of COVID? I think we can, we can certainly deal with the flow. And so far, thank God, Alhamdulillah, uh, there, there has not been an issue in general of availability of beds. Um, our issue is that many people are dying with COVID and not necessarily being reported to the system. Uh, and because we do have a high mortality rate amongst our elderly and adults, um, so I think I can see a number of questions also on people wanting me to predict what will happen. As I've said, we have put our model out and it shows that we will be dealing with this virus for many months to come. Uh, it will not have, inshallah, a disaster like New York or elsewhere where you had just hundreds and thousands of cases in the health system broke down. I think if we have general measures of uh, prevention, if people are aware and they're not silly, I'm very, very worried that with the relaxation of the lockdown, people are just going to go from zero to 100. 
So, you know, life back to normal, it was, that was never the idea. The idea was that you would relax lockdown to some extent to allow some activities and safe activities, but not things back to normal. I tell you here in North America, uh, we are all working from home and it looks like we'll be working from home for the next three, four months. Even when things return to normal, only a fraction of the people will be going to offices. And some people have decided like our program that we are better off working from home. Here in, in Pakistan also, um, people will just have to come up with new strategies. I've actually recommended that what I just told you a little earlier on, that for physicians in particular, going back to the model of very busy, heavy clinics uh, with hundreds of patients waiting in waiting rooms is just not tenable. Uh, and that, that is going to be a big risk and people are not going to come. Once they start realizing that they can get infected in that environment, they're not going to bring your, their children. So we need to look at what kind of alternative strategies we can have to provide safe services that can include domiciliary visits by nurses, uh, by, uh, by uh, our, our physician assistants, and physicians themselves, if possible, um, in, a, in a manner that is affordable for people. And this is particularly true for the elderly. I, I think we need to be very careful about sequestering elderly, our parents, grandparents, and making sure that they're not exposed to the risks of public sector hospitals or private sector large hospitals with waiting areas. Sir, what is your opinion regarding the spread of COVID-19 during uh, summer season due to air conditioning or fan or cooler? So would it be worse with this, with this or the same? I don't know, uh, but I am not very impressed with the data on uh, the summer season by itself uh, being sufficient for um, uh, reducing the severity of this infection. In fact, there is a massive outbreak in some of the hottest parts of Brazil right now, which has killed hundreds and thousands of people in the middle of the Amazon. So, so I think the important thing is to make sure that you uh, have good hygiene. In general, remember that air conditioning and I know it's very hot in Karachi or Pakistan right now. Uh, when you have air conditioning, it dries the air. And this virus thrives on dry air. So, so I think using humidity, humidifiers is important. And ensuring that you do not use... Remember, air conditioners recirculate the air. So you should be refreshing the air and not recirculating it um, uh, more than necessary. Dr. Mamtaz Lakhani has uh, uh, one, one comment, uh, comment. I am just reading out it. Vaccination is av available for next three months as per PPA form. The next question is, this is the question asked by two, three, actually to our colleagues. What is the situation so far in West with this Kawasaki-like syndrome reported as immune modulation? I, I just gave you the stuff in detail. We are still learning early stages. Uh, in North America, some 85 cases have been reported as of yesterday, uh, of which a significant chunk uh, are in New York, where the epicenter of the disease is. In England, uh, they are dealing with around about two dozen cases or so. Uh, so it is there. In, in Toronto, we have seen one. Uh, so it's there. Uh, and uh, what percentage, what proportion, we don't quite know. Uh, we are also trying to see if there is, because there are some of these cases who are actually COVID negative also. So we're trying to see if there is an association and if it is true, Kawasaki or Kawasaki-like syndrome. So be aware of this. Uh, where there are a large number of cases, this will come and it will be, it will be presenting just like I showed you slides of with the multi-system inflammatory disorder uh, and it needs to be taken pretty seriously. Uh, the next related to this, uh, what they treat in the uh, this is in the West actually the question. What they treated as uh, as same as Kawasaki, as uh, with steroid and immunomodulator. And uh, so nobody uses steroids anymore. Immunomodulation, yes. IVIG. The answer is yes. They have received IVIG, uh, and many of them are being washed with uh, additional uh, remdesivir treatment. So. Uh, early days. So I'm not in a position yet to give you a definitive answer of a treatment protocol. 
but these are virtually evolving by the day. And I think they'll come out of the US very, very soon with some recommendations for uh, therapy. Uh, there are recommendations for diagnosis that I've shared with you. Uh, so watch that space very closely. So this is Dr. Anam Khan. Uh, she is asking with the second wave expected, is there a role of exposing healthy people at low risk of complication to get exposed to develop some level of herd immunity? Dr. Khan, you don't need to worry about this. They will get exposed. All of us will get exposed at some stage or the other. The question really is, what's the safe level of exposure and how long before you get population level uh, herd immunity, generally, which is around 60, 70, 75% of the population. Uh, and can the health system cope with the burden of illness while you get there? Uh, so all of those things are things that we are actively looking into. Uh, my sense right now is that we will be dealing with uh, this infection for the remainder of this year and the peak may be well around July, August. And I think uh, if that happens, uh, we just need to keep our guard up, all right? So no reason to panic. We just have to learn to live with this virus and, and to do the best that we can to adjust our clinical practice and our lives around it. Sir, as you attended the meeting, the health task force meeting with the prime minister, so what is your opinion? Can we go for another phase of complete or strict lockdown in the start of June as the patient numbers are increasing rapidly? I think we just need to wait and see. Uh, I think they have to relax just for the sake of economy and other considerations. Um, but yes, if things go out of hand, there is always a plan to do, uh, you know, phased lockdowns and very localized cluster approaches. As you know, Turkey has just reimposed lockdown for three days. Uh, so this is the response that public health people have. So it's a question of balance. Release, close. Release, close. Uh, but I think what we are hoping, what I hope will happen is that there'll be a change in lifestyle. And there'll be a change in practice. If nothing else, this should lead to a hand-washing revolution in Pakistan by just people being aware of hygiene, by the government being aware of the fact that it needs to invest in the social sector. So, you know, to a large extent, this should happen. I have been saying to people this should be a boon for pediatricians because for decades we've been complaining about the lack of intensive care facilities for our newborns in districts. Now that people are suddenly wakening up to the importance of oxygen, pulse oximetry, CPAP, ventilation, we should be capitalizing on this to ensure that these babies who are dying at a rate of around 40 per thousand live births can be saved. So I would like the Pediatric Association and pediatricians in Pakistan to be thinking one step ahead of all of this. How can you benefit from some of the side ramifications of this outbreak and what it does to health system strengthening to be doing better for the women and children of the country. So, sir, what is your opinion, keeping in view the current situation of lockdown in Pakistan? So, uh, would we face another peak or maybe the uh, first time peak in June? I think you will, you will have a rise in cases. Whether I'll call it a peak or a steady rise is moot. As you know, we have just published on and made our, our model available in the public space, which gives you a projected number by province and by time. So I think we will have definitely more cases in June than we have had in August and uh, in, June, in uh, May. And we just have to see how we can deal with it. I'm just uh, hoping and rooting for the fact that after so much effort, sacrifice by everybody and investment by the government that we'll succeed. Any idea regarding the availability of vaccine? Um, ask me this question again in October. Uh, the, I think it's a safe bet to say we will not have a vaccine this year. Even if a vaccine is approved, it will take months for it to come. So we are looking at a vaccine potentially next year, inshallah, but you will not have a vaccine in Pakistan this year. Okay. Sir, would you also explain regarding the non-specific symptoms in children other than the respiratory and GI? Well, they're just like any other illness. I mean, uh, fever, 
being upset, loss of appetite, a uh, little bit of GI upset, diarrhea. Vomiting is not a major feature of this disorder and cough and some respiratory stress all have been reported in children. The systemic inflammatory response is something very specific to children that's not been seen in adults. It's something that we need to be aware of and it may be just an, an immune response for all we know. So, so I think these are things that uh, you know, we need to be aware of. So Professor Amin John, he is asking about the sensitivity and specificity of the antibody, antibody testing. Oh, um, many of these antibody tests have a specificity of around 99% and sensitivity any, anywhere between 70 to 90%. So sensitivity is generally a bit lower than specificity, which is what we are more concerned about. But as I said, all of these are under FDA consideration and some will be approved for test and use in Pakistan soon, inshallah. So Dr. Sajid and I are working with Stanford to try and get one such test into Pakistan soon. There's a question on the link to the modeling pu publication. Everybody is putting their pre-publications on a website called Medrex. Uh, we, until the time that journals, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, published your paper. So we have published, uh, we have put our modeling paper out on metrics. I can send it to UDS and, uh, uh, and it's with the government. Sajid, I, I see one question that I will take as a last question and, uh, and then maybe beg your leave. Uh, a perception has been developed around misinformation, conspiracy theories, and what have you. They can, this happens every time. We have dealt with this, you and I have dealt with this with polio. We have dealt with this with measles immunization and, and autism. It is our responsibility to ensure that this disinformation or fake news is challenged and is opposed as best as possible. This virus is not a Yahudi conspiracy. This virus is not something which was manufactured in a lab and just released on the world. And I say, even if it was, let's say you don't know, and nobody knows right now, but we are dealing with it right now. What difference does it make? The fact is it can kill people and it has killed people in Pakistan. To, you know, two months ago, people said, this will not do anything in Pakistan. Now you have seen it has killed people in the prime of their life. It has, it has caused so much misery. It has caused our health system to virtually buckle at its knees. It's a real disease. And it does not spare you, whether you are a Muslim, non-Muslim, or anybody. More Muslims have died of this uh, virus in the West than you can imagine in the health services. How many physicians have died in North America? How many physicians have died in, and died in UK uh, who uh, you know, are of Pakistani origin? So I think you should not, uh, in, under any circumstances, allow this disinformation to go on. I know it's there, but it is something that we need to do as society, educate our people, our ulama, to make sure that they put this message out there, that this virus is real. And, and it is there, and it will cause tremendous damage unless we are able to mitigate against it. So, Sajid and Salman, it's almost time. I would like to sir, beg your leave sir, and... Sir, thank um, you. Sir, just, 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 just a minute, Jay. Sir, thank you very much for our, this uh, enlightening talk. But now I will request Dean Dr. Adal for the closing remarks and comments. Dr. 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 Uh, Dr. Adal? Oh, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm looking for him. He was uh, here at the beginning of the talk. He may have had to leave uh, for another yeah. meeting. So, but anyway, I'd like no, to thank you. You don't need to thank me. I need to thank you for the opportunity to, to be able to speak to you once again. I did so just a couple of weeks ago. And I will uh, update you on, on this. I want to particularly thank um, a Pakistani AKU graduate who's working with me on this on systematic analysis of global literature, uh, Dr. Omar Irfan. He's an AKU graduate. And he's one of my research team members here in Toronto who's doing the systematic analysis of... Uh, uh, children. At the same time, I see I saw Zora Lassi online, and she is no longer a student but a peer. And Zora is in Australia, and she's working with us on looking at the maternal side of things. So, inshallah, very soon 
as a fruit of their efforts, we'll be able to give you synthesis of the best information at this point in time on the effect of this virus on mothers and children, worldwide newborns, and then we will be periodically updating it. So I'll be happy to come back in about a month's time uh, and talk to you on the basis of what we know and what else has changed. Thank you very much for the honor of speaking to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bhutta. I really, truly appreciate uh, your coming on to us and we'll definitely uh, ask you again uh, at the end of the month and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Allah Hafiz. Thanks to everyone for listening.